podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Energy Actions to Go. I'm Nancy Quirk, the Energy Program Manager with Sustainable Jersey, and this webinar is part of our Virtual Sustainability Summit. We're thrilled to have you all with us today. Uh, we have quite a crowd. Um, we have municipal representatives, schools, school boards, um, counties have joined us. Quite a few of our usual friends are on board. We welcome all of you. We're very excited to give you um, what we hope will be an inspiring overview of our energy actions with lots of uh, tips and ideas for you to get started. Because this is part of our sustainability um, virtual sustainability summit, I want to first go over some announcements uh, and in particular of course in our current situation with a lot of folks at home and doing having a lot of different work procedures and so forth. Um, the first big announcement we have from Sustainable Jersey is that we've changed our certification timeline for both programs for the municipal program and the school program. So for schools, um, you're already in, in session, if you will, uh, and that uh, deadline will actually be tomorrow for this round of school action submissions. There will be another round uh, coming up. And for municipalities, we've extended the first deadline out to June 14th this year. And if you have any questions about that, please contact uh, Samantha at info at sustainablejersey.com or Veronique at Veronique Lambert at tcnj.edu. Uh, Lawrence Gronowski, our tech expert, is offering or providing a matchmaking service for free tech coaching. Many of you are now having to do a lot of online activity, um, meetings, public meetings, uh, any number of things. And um, we've set up a way to match your local government entity with some experts who are volunteering to help you with any of the technical issues that you may now be dealing with um, as you get used to this new normal. And, and we also are uh, want to remind you that uh, the census is currently underway. You can do the census online this year. And we are giving points in both the municipal and schools program for encouraging census participation in your community. We also have a new event in our virtual summit, a census happy hour, which will be this Friday at four o'clock. Please check our website for um, the details of how to register for that happy hour. All of our registration and information about our events, both past events and events yet to come. We've got a great suite of of program activity during this month uh, to sort of celebrate our sustainability summit, which went virtual. Um, so you can see all the recordings of um, previous events. This event, of course, will be recorded and these slides will be available on our website. Give us a couple of days, um, but you will have access to that. And please check out the list of other events coming up. And of course, since we're the energy team, we're going to promote our energy events coming up. We have quite a few and even more in planning. So stay tuned, keep an eye on our website and our e-blast. Um, next week, uh, the, all of the webinars are, are kind of geared toward introducing everyone to all of these energy actions and giving you the resources and tools that, that will help you implement them. So we're getting ready to roll out some guidebooks, uh, toolkits, and, and even online green team trainings to help you get these actions up and running. So next week, we're going to have a deeper dive on tracking your greenhouse gas emissions from your municipal operations. We have a new uh, spreadsheet that will automatically calculate uh, the greenhouse gas emissions once you enter your data. It's not necessarily a breeze, but it's very straightforward. Um, and then we, we will be doing a deeper dive on our energy efficiency outreach toolkits uh, the following week. And then we will also have a webinar dedicated to reviewing and looking into more detail in the Community Solar Energy Pilot Program and our uh, upcoming guidebook. 
So everyone right now is of course muted. If you have a question, please put your question in the question box. Uh, Hogan Dwyer, who's on our staff, will be watching the questions as they come in and trying to answer those that we can. We are planning to have time at the end or even maybe in between different speakers to answer some maybe small questions here and there. We're going to ask you some questions. Um, again, we will uh, be recording this webinar and the slides will be available uh, in a couple of days. So I'm very pleased to announce our speakers today. I, again, am Nancy Quirk, the Energy Program Manager here at Sustainable Jersey, and our data specialist and policy, policy specialist, Zenon Tech Zarni, will take the lead on, on some of our sort of data intensive types of actions, and Tracy Woods, who is a research and project specialist with tremendous community outreach experience under her belt, will take the lead on some of our community facing actions and we're all here to answer your questions. Um, okay. There we go. <laughs> I thought I had a, an overview slide for our, our webinar today. So I'm just going to give you a quick tour of what all we're going to cover today. It's a lot. Buckle your seatbelt. Uh, we did schedule an hour and a half. We're going to try not to talk at you for an hour and a half. Um, but then that will leave some time for questions and answers. But we really are going to give you an overview. Um, again, our real goal is to give you a lot of inspiration, a lot of information on resources, incentive programs, grants, toolkits, guidebooks, you name it. We want to help you get these things done. So we've broken it into energy efficiency and renewable energy for schools and municipalities. Uh, alternative fuel vehicle options for schools and municipalities, and then more community facing, uh, make your town electric vehicle friendly, make your town solar friendly. Uh, a shout out to the community solar energy pilot program, very exciting information there. Um, updates on tips on how to do an energy efficiency outreach campaign for your residents and businesses to bring the benefit of all of these ideas to everyone in your community and renewable energy, government energy aggregation, which um, we'll provide more detail on in a minute. So just a different way of looking at what we're going to cover, but also how we structure our energy actions. Um, this is, you know, from the municipal program, but the schools program is very, very similar. We ask you to really take a close look at how you you know, tracking the energy use in your buildings, finding ways to make them more energy efficient. Once you've got that under control, you move into your renewable energy, um, different approaches to that. Xenon will take a deep dive into both of those areas. And then you've got your municipal fleets. And so you can begin to add, you know, change how you manage your fleets, begin to think about adding alternative fuel vehicles in all vehicle classes. And then on the community side, um, when to reach your residents and your businesses, we want to make the town friendly for solar and introduce a lot of different ways that you can bring renewable energy into the mix in your community. And lastly, last but not least, also promote alternative fuel vehicles, particularly EVs in your community. Again, we'll be mentioning incentives, grants, other resources, guidebooks, toolkits, and so forth to go along with all of these. Oh, my slides are not advancing, excuse me when I say that. So many of you on the line are familiar with our gold star standard in energy. And just this is really just a way to package this in a way to say, you know, again, municipal operations and community-wide activity, if you do as much as you can, why you'll, you know, very likely get to gold. So on the municipal side of, of gold, but again, in general, and things we're going to talk about in this webinar, do everything you can to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions on both sides of this ledger. But on the municipal side, there's a number of things. We don't actually necessarily have all the details in our actions right now, so we're open to great stuff that you're doing, but we do have a lot of detailed information on buildings, fleets, uh, operations, and so forth. And then on the community side, Sustainable Jersey did the research, 
identify the greenhouse gas emissions reductions from things like changing over to electric vehicles, bringing more solar into the community, and very, very importantly, promoting energy efficiency. These will get your greenhouse gas emissions down. So we, we've packaged them all together in gold, but we invite everyone to get engaged. And I realize now, team, we should have probably included a question on who's going for gold, but we didn't. So um, I think I, with that, I will turn it directly over to Zenon Tekzarni, who is, among other things, our data guru, and take it away, Zenon. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nancy. Um, so as Nancy mentioned, I'll be presenting about uh, tracking greenhouse gas emissions from municipal operations on Wednesday, April 7th, um, from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And in this presentation, I'm going to go over how to use Energy Start Portfolio Manager to track and export weather normalized data. Uh, weather normalization is basically taking out the distortion that weather creates um, to energy usage data every year and, and creates a comparable year-to-year -year, um, value. And um, it will also talk about how to use uh, the Sustainable Jersey Fleet Inventory and the, the brand new um, municipal operations uh, uh, change, greenhouse gas emissions change calculator. And so that's what you're seeing right here. Um, we adapted our uh, previous carbon footprint to be able to, to kind of do these calculations and calculate percent change. So it's pretty exciting. And, um, you know, that way you can really start to see um, how much progress you're making or if you're not making progress, you know, how much you need to be making. So um, next slide. So today I'm going to be talking about um, some of the key energy efficiency and renewable energy actions at the municipal operations scale. So I'll talk about uh, the actions, but as well as um, practices and technologies that may not be actions, but are related and perhaps might become actions one day. Um, and then my colleague, Tracy Woods, is going to be talking about um, transportation initiatives at the municipal operations scale. And together, uh, those are uh, ways that you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions on the municipal operations uh, level. And uh, if, I don't know, yeah, I guess uh, Nancy didn't mention, but in order to re receive gold, the gold star standard in energy, you need to have a 3.6% annual rate of reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So um, I'll be talking a little bit more about that next week. but. Um, something to keep in mind. So um, moving forward, um, uh, the first action I want to talk about today is energy tracking and management. This is really the, the keystone action in the, the municipal operations actions. And it's, it's really the first step that anybody should be doing in terms of energy work at the municipal scale. Um, the famous quote is, uh, you can't manage what you uh, can't track. And so, um, you know, tracking your energy is, is really uh, very important. And in order to, to do that and to complete this action, there's various ways you can do it, but uh, for 10 points, you need to provide a building portfolio of your, um, a, a written building portfolio of all your buildings. Um, so on the municipal scale, you know, that's the municipal building, the fire department, the police building. And also, you know, this action is both a um, municipal action and a school action. And uh, so uh, you need to provide that portfolio as well as 12 months of energy usage data, uh, usually within the past, past year. And then for the additional 10 points, uh, you need to provide a benchmarking report. And uh, in order to do that, you uh, can uh, put your data into Energy Star Portfolio Manager, which we, we highly recommend and you can export a statement of energy performance and uh, get this type of report shown here. And it will show you your Energy Star score, which is a, a score that is one to 100 that the Energy Star um, has, has created and it compares your building to other similar buildings throughout the country. And so it's a really great way to um, be able to see how you're doing and compared to other, other um, buildings. And then also you have to demonstrate an energy tracking management system. 
And so um, an, an energy tracking management system for this action is really about um, showing how you're doing ongoing energy tracking and, and also how that relates to um, doing upgrades. Um, but uh, that's, that's what we mean in this action. But actually, uh, as uh, Nancy's flipped to, um, the next slide really talks about energy management in general. And I wanted to kind of differentiate that, that um, the two phrases because um, energy management is, is a kind of a broader picture of, or broader uh, set of um, strategies for um, making um, kind of energy improvements to your building, but also just good uh, energy practices. And so here are some of the strategies that uh, energy management includes um, that can include energy tracking and benchmarking, which we just talked about. But it also can talk, it can include creating a culture of energy conservation, such as retro commissioning, which I'll, I'll talk about, behavior based conservation. So that's like turning off your lights and making sure that uh, you're not using uh, you know, energy, um, excessive energy that way. Um, preventative maintenance, demand side management, which is really um, about making sure that you manage um, peak demand primarily. And so demand response is what we typically refer to when we, uh, we talk about managing peak demand. And when I say that, I mean that um, you know, certain times, certain times of the year, certain times of the day, um, there's an increase in energy uh, demand and you know it's important to manage that and and turn off certain uh, equipment and operations in order to uh, prevent the use of peaker plants, which um, can be highly polluting. And um, that's uh, an important practice of energy management. Other um, strategies include acquiring funding and equipment upgrades, building electrification, um, uh, evaluating facilities for renewable energy, energy storage and uh, ad adoption of uh, alternative fuel vehicles, which Tracy will talk about later. And uh, I should mention that we will be, we've, we have been working on a guide for energy management and we will be uh, releasing that soon. So, um, so um, as mentioned, retro commissioning is one of the aspects of energy management. And uh, what rec retro commissioning is, is essentially tuning up your building to um, the, the specs that it, it really should uh, be operating under. So, you know, those thermostats uh, are set to a certain um, temperature and other equipment uh, is, is set to a certain, in a certain way. And oftentimes those um, systems get changed. And by actually just going back and resetting them, and making sure that um, you know everything is working functionally, you can save substantial amounts of energy, and it also Im improve indoor air quality and comfort, and and also save a lot of money. And so, as the, these diagrams show, retro commissioning, the one on the top here, is part of this um, integrated upgrade approach, and it's really they say the first step in terms of um, making these types of upgrades. Um, and it's, it's actually fairly simple. I mean, there are a retro commissioning professionals or you could have an on, on trained on staff person to do retro commissioning. And actually the payback for retro commissioning actually is really significant. As you can see here um, the, in the maintenance and operations um, sections, uh, the payback is approximately less than two years in terms of um, the uh, cost. And so typically um, retro commissioning costs anywhere between um, 13 cents to $2 per square foot and the payback is about um, anywhere between uh, 0.2 and, and two years. So it's, it's a really um, cost effective way and you can get a substantial amount of energy as you can see up to 30%. So another um, practice, energy ma management practice, uh, next slide, is uh, behavior-based uh, energy conservation programs. And uh, we uh, have an action uh, for the schools program. We don't ha currently have an action for the municipal, on the municipal side, but this is, a, like I said before, about turning off your lights and making sure that, um, you know, we're not using as much energy through behavior. And um, in the schools program, 
you can get 10 points and uh, there's there's a number of uh, different things you can do. Um, and actually for, for those that are in uh, South Jersey gas and New Jersey natural gas territory, there's a great program called the Power Save Schools program. It's through the Alliance to Save Energy. And uh, they actually provide the curriculum and all the things that you can do. And as you can see here, um, the students from uh, George, uh, I'm gonna butcher this, Catch Rabone uh, Elementary School, um, you know, were in the program and they were able to kind of audit all the energy uses. And they found out, out, out that actually um, the teacher's lounge is the biggest culprit of energy waste because of the, the coolers, I mean, the vending machines. So um, I think that was a fun activity for the students to learn about and also um, you know, become better stewards of energy. So um, next I'm gonna talk about the energy efficiency for facilities action. So this is also an action that can be done at the municipal level and also the schools level. And it's a, it's a multi-tiered action, which um, starts at five points, and that begins with an audit for one building, uh, then goes to 10 points, which um, is an audit for all the buildings in the portfolio, 15 points, which is uh, doing significant energy efficiency upgrade work on one building, 20 points um, for uh, um, uh, LGA audit, local government energy audit, which we'll talk about later, audit for all buildings, plus, um, significant work for one building. And then the 30, 40, and 50 point levels, which are based on um, achieving energy savings. And that can be done either with a, an estimate um, or with achieved savings. But if you do use an estimate, then uh, you don't get uh, as many years. And if you do uh, get achieved savings, you get it for um, 10 years, you get the points for 10 years. So those are big energy points that you know can really last a long time in the program so it's a great way to kind of have a good um, amount of points to get from the get-go um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk exactly about um, the how to do the action I'm going to talk mainly about um, the, the various aspects of the action especially the New, Jer New Jersey's clean energy program which um, we uh, highly recommend in terms of um, doing it, doing the action. Um, the, the first tier points are based off of the local government energy audit. And then the other tiers, the, the um, tiers about energy savings are really largely based off of doing the incent, getting the incentives to do the energy efficiency work. And it's really a no brainer for um, anybody that's doing energy efficiency work in, in the state because the incentives are just so generous. And, um, you, this, this is funded by the societal benefits charge. So we all pay for this throughout the state. And so it's really about taking advantage of, of uh, programs that you know, we've all paid for. So um, I'm gonna talk real quickly about several of these programs highlighted in um, red on the left-hand side. Um, they actually have a, a website, first of all, um, a website geared towards um, municipalities and schools. So that you can see the URL on the top. But um, I'm gonna talk real quickly about Smart Start, which is a incentive program about getting uh, rebates for equipment. So it's a, it's a pretty easy to use incentive program where you can um, essentially you know, buy the equipment and then get rebates for it. And um, it's on a case-by-case -case basis and you have to make sure that the equipment qualifies, but they're, they're pretty flexible and it's a long list of equipment. So, and one of the great things, especially for those that have a little bit more time on their hand right now, they can actually get refunded um, retroactively. So if you already made the purchases recently, you can actually get uh, funded. And you can get up to $500,000 per utility account. So it's a lot of money that you can save that way. Um, pay, for, 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 bleh, pay for performance is another incentive program, which is primarily geared towards larger buildings. And um, it, it basically pays you to, to kind of save the, the energy and you can get up to 15% uh, energy savings that way. Um, and uh, it's mainly geared towards, um, well, it can be for new construction or existing facilities. So the new construction has to be over 50,000 square feet and existing facilities need to use over uh, 200 uh, kilowatts in peak demand. Um, and then the, the third program I want to talk about real quickly here is direct install. 
um, direct install is highly popular and um, it uh, pays up to um, typically 70% of the costs of uh, energy efficiency work. And uh, if you're in an urban enterprise zone or an opportunity zone, it can pay up to 80%. So a um, lot of funding, and this is a turnkey type of situation where there are uh, verified vendors um, throughout the state that um, are vetted through the clean energy program and will we'll do the work for you. Um, and this is mainly for um, you know, lighting and equipment upgrades. Um, and so uh, you can get a lot of energy savings that way. And there's a, a $125,000 cap, project cap, and a $250,000 en entity cap. So if you're an entity applying, that's the, the max, but it's, it's still a significant amount of money. So um, I guess next, next uh, I'll talk about um, the utility incentive program. So in addition to um, the New Jersey's clean energy program, several utilities offer their own incentives. So you have to, to check what's your utility and what incentives they offer, but um, they, they can be um, also fairly generous. And um, actually they, they can offer on bill, things like on bill repayment. So essentially you'll be paying your bill um, you know, from the savings that you're, you're getting. So it's a, it's a great deal. And uh, you know, I, I highly recommend everybody to check their own utility, see their, their incentives. Um, so one of the other um, incentives mentioned in that list was local government energy audits. And I mentioned this in, as part of the action um, for several of the first tiered levels of the EE for school facilities or municipal facilities action. Um, you can you you should create a local government energy audit, and that's a, a free free audit um, paid by the um, clean energy program. And uh, it's uh, I highly recommend it. They do an ASHRAE level two audit, which is a pretty good standard for evaluating your energy use. Uh, the one catch is that you need to have a building that has a, a monthly average peak demand of 200 kilowatts. Um, although there are exceptions and you can bundle um, certain buildings, say if you're a municipality, um, with, with a higher, higher using energy using building. So, um, you know, if you have one building that's high energy using, you can kind of add a few more if they also are um, major, but not quite, they don't meet the criteria. And uh, you can get up to a $100,000 uh, cap for um, these audits. And so you can get a, quite a, a decent amount done um, to, for most municipal portfolios that, that can cover most major buildings. Um, and so uh, we highly recommend doing the, the LGEA. Next, I'll talk about heat pumps. So um, I wanted to make a special shout out for heat pumps because um, one of the key things that Sustainable Jersey is interested in is, in, is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And, um, you know, you can make energy efficiency upgrades um, to uh, efficient furnaces and other equipment that use natural gas, um, which is, is certainly better than using um, uh, wasteful uh, furnaces or other equipment that uses natural gas. But what we really want to, to do is essentially decarbonize and electrify um, all um, building equipment, heating and cooling included, and um, heat pumps are a fantastic technology to, to do that. So when you're doing your direct install or you're um, making decisions in terms of what upgrades to, to make, we highly recommend considering um, heat pumps. And there's three major different types of heat pumps. There's air source, which can be uh, shown on the top left, um, you know, typical, like it's, it looks sort of like a typical HVAC unit. Then there's the ductless mini split, which um, has this, you know, unit um, on, the, on the wall, which is called a, peep, a, a pump head. And uh, these, these uh, ductless mini splits are actually highly efficient because they don't use ducts. And so, you know, when you have ducts, there's a lot of heat loss um, or cooling loss in, in the duct system. And, and this essentially makes it direct. And, uh, and then there's um, ground source heat pumps, which um, you can actually get points for if you do this um, to one, uh, either a school or municipal facility. 
And there's several different permutations in terms of how you do a, a geothermal heat pump. Um, one of the common criticisms of heat pumps is that they don't really work under certain temperatures, but they actually are getting much more efficient. Um, the way that heat pumps work, I should have mentioned this earlier, is that they use heat transfer. So, you know, just like, uh, you know, air con um, uh, a refrigerator uses heat transfer to pull out all the heat from a refrigerator, heat pumps sort of work in, in the same similar way. And so, um, you know, as you get colder outside, they become less efficient, um, but they are, get, the technology is getting much, much better. And sometimes you might need to have um, an augmentation uh, of, um, or supplementary, a second source of heating um, with a heat pump. But, you know, in terms of most heating and cooling, you know, especially now we're not getting that cold anymore um, during the winter. Um, and so actually they can work pretty much year, year round without using the, the additional heating source. Um, ground source heat pumps, and that, I should mention that was for, that's for air sourced heat pumps. Ground sourced heat pumps actually work at any temperature because it's actually, they use uh, the, the temperature from the ground, which is at a consistent 55 degrees. So um, yeah, highly efficient, we highly recommend it. Next, um, I also wanna make a plug for um, combined heat and power. And so this is oftentimes referred to as cogeneration or uh, micro CHP. And um, essentially the CHP system uses, it's a highly efficient system. It creates a kind of a local power plant where it uses natural gas to um, you know, create heat, but also produces energy. Um, and so there's two main kinds of CHP systems. One, this is the one shown is a simple boiler to steam turbine. But then also there's um, another kind that uses a heat recovery unit. And now actually there's incentives through the clean energy program to include fuel cells in uh, the CHP system, which are actually, as you can see here, very uh, futuristic looking. This is what uh, one example of one. Um, and what they do is they use the um, natural gas to reform it to, to hydrogen, which can be, then be used to uh, produce um, electricity. Uh, and so this is a, a much more um, environmentally friendly and um, resilient way system for using CHP, which can be used for um, you know, battery storage and also um, you know, microgrids, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And I should mention that there is, a, I guess, a $3 million cap for the projects. And, there's certain expectations for efficiency. So um, next I'll talk about um, the e energy savings improvement program. And so this is a, a great tool that um, the BPU um, runs and was allowed by a 2009 state law that allows um, government agencies to make energy related improvements to their facilities and pay for the cost using the value of energy savings that result from the improvements. So you get to use the, the future savings up front and uh, it's cash flow positive. So um, as you can see here on the diagram on the left, um, you know, you start with your existing utility bill, which you know is higher. And then once you do the savings, a portion of it will, once we do that work, then a portion of it will go towards repayment. And then actually a portion of it, you can actually start to use for, um, you know, municipal budget. And then eventually it'll pay itself off. And the ESA program is designed to work with the clean energy program's incentives. So, you know, the first step is really to do that local government energy audit, and then you can use those uh, other incentives to essentially get you know, good savings. And you create an energy savings plan, and then you'll, um, you know, do the work and essentially um, package everything together. Um, and the Sustainable Jersey actually just recently created an ESIP guidebook, which I highly recommend everybody check out to kind of understand the details about this. But an energy ESIP is, is a really great way to package a lot of energy efficiency work in a comprehensive way. Oftentimes you have certain uh, energy efficiency work that um, will you know, have a, uh, have a longer payback period and you can bundle it with things that have shorter payback periods to sort of um, make it more set, make uh, the, upgrades make more sense financially. Um, and uh, so actually right now I'm gonna take a pause to um, 
open up a poll to see if anybody is interested in one-on-one uh, -on -one consultation with the Clean Energy Program to learn more about uh, incentives for uh, municipalities and schools. So um, I'm going to give a minute for people to um, submit that, and uh, once once we're good, then we'll move on. And uh, yeah, we, we highly recommend it, you know, doing a consultation with the Clean Energy Program, you know, it's, it's totally free and they will tell you uh, all the things that you can do to uh, get the most bang for your buck and, and kind of get, get into the system to do an audit and also um, do that energy efficiency work. Right now, I'll, excuse me, I'll try to jump in. Um, yeah, Sustainable Jersey works very closely with the Clean Energy Program and, and will facilitate that introduction. So we have just about half the folks voting. We'll give you a few more seconds. Um, so 10 more seconds. <laughs> yeah, right. So looks like a majority are are interested, uh, about 60, 40. So thank you very much. I'm going to close the poll now. Um, and we'll move the slides forward. All right. Great. Oh, Zeno, so, uh, oh, yes. just time. Just keep time. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll try to wrap up quickly. So, um, so uh, next I'm going to talk about green roofs. Uh, green roofs are, are also a great way to, um, promote, I guess, have a more efficient building. They can reduce energy costs, improve comfort, also reduce urban heat island, which kind of cools down the whole entire area, um, also helps with stormwater management, and you can actually um, get uh, points for um, the green infrastructure implementation action. So. Um, next, um, so another um, great municipal operation action is the on-site solar system action, and this can also be done at the municipal and schools level. Um, and it's the three different tiers, and then an additional ten points if you have energy storage. So the tiers are, as you can see, um, based off of the percentage of energy savings. And uh, you need to show displaced energy. And as you can see here on the right, um, there is a table uh, from Cherry Hills um, solar installation that shows how much um, savings they received from the solar or displaced energy they received from the solar. Um, and so part of that action the, is um, using photovoltaic, but uh, the other part is using solar thermal, which, um, Next slide. Uh, solar thermal is uh, a way to actually heat up uh, water. So uh, typically in, uh, you know, for sinks and for um, showers, and actually it's a, it's a very cost-effective, efficient way to, to heat, heat water. And it uses the sun, so it requires the, the sun to be shining, but actually it can be done essentially or used year round. Um, because of the insulated glass, you can actually be um, using actually warm water even when it's really cold out. And as you can see here, this is a photo from Minneapolis, which is you know fairly cold climate most of the year. And uh, and uh, you know you can get actually 80% savings in terms of water heating. So it's it can be very efficient in that regard. And here's some of the ways it can be used: city hall, fire stations, etc. And uh, also, I, I want to highlight Manchester's um, installation, which, as you can see here, doesn't take that much space. And actually, it's on a police station there and provides um, hot water for five showers and 16 sinks. So all that natural gas that would otherwise be heating the, um, the water um, is, is being done like this. All right, next. Um, and so you can get points with through that, and you can also get points through um, doing a typical photovoltaic solar installation, 
which can be done on the roof, um, on schools or municipalities. It could be a ground mount or um, a parking lot solar canopy, which um, actually the next slide shows a nice example. These are um, kind of a roof and a ground, and this is a, a solar canopy that was done at, at the Hopewell Valley Central High School. And it, it actually was also paired with um, battery storage. So they can they, you can get an extra 20 points when you do that. Um, and uh, it also, this was used as a, as a emergency um, warming station center. And so uh, there's a resiliency component as well. So batteries um, are not super widely adopted yet, but that's gonna be a very critical aspect of the future energy grid and it can provide resilience when the grid is the macro grid is down um, it can charge um, batteries it can charge off peak so that way you know you you're utilizing that energy um, when uh, it's off peak hours and it can defer upgrades and reduce greenhouse gas emissions so um, it's very something that that all municipalities and schools should look into um, next we uh, are going to talk about two kind of cool concepts so zero energy buildings and net zero um i, I should say those are the the same thing um but uh essentially a net zero building is a building with um, net zero um, energy consumption meaning that the total amount of energy used by the building on an annual basis is equal to the amount of renewable created on site so you know it, sometimes the, people believe that you know a, zero energy building needs solar on the building and actually can also have a ground mount nearby. And it, it also can use energy from the grid. It's just uh, an annual, it, annually it needs to produce less or, um, ener or energy or produce more energy than it consumes. Sorry. And so this is a nice example though of a beautiful building in um, Washington. It's the Geophysical Union building. And uh, actually, um, it's, the Department of Energy is, is very, very much promoting the, this concept, and um, it, there's actually a certification standard through the International Living Future Living Future Institute. Um, but you know, you don't really need to do the standard to do it. Um, I think that anybody can really uh, and should be doing it. And and so the other concept is uh, passive house, and uh, passive house is uh, similar in that it, it doesn't use that much energy but it, it's actually much more rigorous and uh, it really relies on um, high insulation and um, moving air. So it, it does actually have a very good um, air quality aspect to it because you're using fresh air, but you know, that's been um, kind of brought to, to a neutral temperature and also uses solar, uh, obviously. And so um, solar through photovoltaics, but also passive solar by um, orienting the building in a way where during the winter it uh, utilizes the sun to, to heat most of the building. So it's a really cool concept. This is actually, it, 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 the, the name sort of makes it seem like it's a residential thing, but actually it can be applied to, to offices, municipal offices, uh, commercial offices, schools, et cetera. And this is an example in Germany of an energy company that you know, has utilized passive solar or passive house, sorry. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to talk about microgrids. Um, you know, we've talked about a lot of different technologies here and you know, things that you can do to different buildings um, and you know, solar installations that you can create and batteries. And if you want to bring this all together to create um, a microgrid, which is, is a grid that can essentially um, can disconnect from the macro grid and power itself in case of emergency or you know if it, a peak there's a peak time um, and you know you can actually have a much more resilient and sustainable um, system in place and one of the other kind of components which is kind of a segue to the the next uh, topic is uh, electric vehicles can actually be part of this microgrid system through uh, their battery storage and so with that i'm going to turn uh, it over to my colleague, Tracy Woods, who's gonna be talking about uh, doing a fleet inventory. Hi, thanks, Zenon, for that. Uh, yeah, as Zenon said, the first set of actions I'm gonna talk about today are the Sustainable Jersey Transportation Actions. 
And there are three actions that pertain to the greening of the municipal fleet and two actions that support electrical vehicle, electric vehicle adoption in the community. Uh, before I dig into those actions, I want to make sure everybody is um, knows about a webinar that's coming up in June called Adding Electric Vehicles to Your Municipal Fleet and Community. We haven't set a date for that webinar yet, but keep an eye out for the announcement and we hope you'll be able to join us. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first transportation action I'm going to talk about is fleet inventory. And the reason to talk about this action first is because having an understanding of what's already in your municipal fleet helps municipal leaders determine the best ways to green the fleet. To complete this action, municipality needs to complete the fleet inventory spreadsheet that's embedded. Uh, there's a link embedded in the text of the action. In the first page of the spreadsheet, which is shown here in the picture on the right with the yellow cells, and this is a case study from Ocean City, uh, the municipality lists all of their fleet vehicles, including their annual fuel usage and mileage. In the second sheet, which is the middle image here, uh, the spreadsheet calculates all the emissions by fuel type automatically. And then the third sheet shown at the bottom, um, the uh, spreadsheet calculates the total fleet emissions again automatically. And um, when we talk to municipalities that have done this action, we know from them that it's a bit of a heavy lift, especially in the first year when you have to enter in all the data initially, but that they found it really helpful. Seeing the fleet efficiency uh, and usage of the vehicles laid out helped to point out which vehicles should be driven less, which should be slated for replacement, and which could be efficiently upgraded to alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. That leads us to the purchase alternative fuel vehicle action. This action is worth five through 15 points, depending on which technology you purchase. Eligible technologies include plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, fully electric vehicles, pursuit class hybrid vehicles for police and law enforcement, and then for heavy duty service vehicles, such as recycling and trash collection, compressed natural gas or electric vehicles are eligible. Uh, next slide, please. Let's take a second to review the benefits of electric vehicles. They have significantly lower emissions and reduced cost of maintenance and fuel mean that they often have a lower lifetime cost from comparable gasoline vehicles. There are also many incentives and rebates available at this time to help municipalities add alternative fuel vehicles to their fleet. A link included in the text of this action goes to the Sustainable Jersey Alternative Fuel Procurement Guide. This guide has information about incentives and procurement options for alternative fuel fleet vehicles and infrastructure, including information about fleet leasing, direct purchase of vehicles with a discount from the dealer in lieu of a tax credit, using purchasing cooperatives and government contracts for purchasing without competitive bidding, and also uh, acquiring alternative fuel vehicle services through service contracts, and doing that as a shared service with other municipalities to make it more feasible as well. Next slide, please. So um, the procurement guide also features a list of incentives available from different entities. Two that we'd like to feature today are the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection It Pays to Plug-In Program, which has funding for electric vehicle charging infrastructure up to $6,000 for a dual port level two charger, and you can see the web address there. Also, the Board of Public Utilities has the Clean Fleet Electric Vehicle Program uh, that is funded until uh, the funding runs out. And you can see the link for that as well. And on the right side of the screen, uh, you'll see a um, listing of electric vehicles that are available on the state purchasing contract. Uh, this means that municipalities can purchase these vehicles through the contract without going through a competitive bidding process and at a discount. Uh, you can see the electric vehicles that are currently available and their pricing. And on the procurement, in the procurement guide, there are links directly to the spec sheets and invoices for these vehicles. It, they can be a little bit hard to find directly on the uh, state purchasing site. So having those links in the procurement guide is very helpful. Uh, next slide, please. The Sustainable Jersey for Schools uh, certification program also has a corollary action called the Sustainable Fleet Action. Again, this action's worth five through 15 points and eligible vehicles include plug-in electric hybrid vehicles, fully plug-in electric vehicles, propane and electric school buses, and then for heavyweight classes, a vehicle uh, compressed natural gas or electric vehicles are eligible. 
would just take a quick second to make a case for electric school buses. Electric school buses have zero tailpipe emissions, which is really important for improving air quality at school environments, especially with the prevalence of asthma issues. They're very quiet and they're cost effective. Now they do have a much higher initial purchase price, on average $120,000 more for an electric school bus than a traditional bus. But through reduced fuel and maintenance cost, a 2018 study by the United States Public Interest Research Group showed a lifetime savings of an electric school bus to be around $140,000. And they define a lifetime um, usage as 20 years. So uh, that's a good thing. There are procurement options for electric school buses listed in the procurement guide uh, as well. Next slide, please. The last action that pertains to municipal fleets is the Meet Targets for Green Fleets action. This action, which is worth 30 points, looks at overall emissions and fuel efficiency of the municipal fleet. To get points for this action, it is required that you demonstrate an average fuel efficiency of 35 miles per gallon, gallon for light duty vehicles or a 20% reduction in fuel usage between two fleet inventories. This action includes a list of strategies for reducing fuel usage in the municipal fleet, and um, those include fleet management strategies, fleet route optimization, telematics, which is a technology that tracks fuel vehicle usage, hybridizing vehicles with idle reduction technology. That's a cost-effective technology, and you can see in the picture on the right side of the screen uh, that that's being implemented in a Woodbridge fire truck. Uh, and other towns in the Sustainable Jersey um, family have used that technology successfully, and also converting vehicles to alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, we want to take a second and launch a second poll about telematics, um, and I'll let Nancy now. We want to just see which um, participants in this webinar are currently using telematics or are interested in it. And just as a reminder, uh, that's technology that tracks fleet vehicle usage. So we'll give a little bit of time for you to answer that. And uh, I'll just say while we're letting the poll run that those three actions I just reviewed address uh, municipal fleet emissions. And now I'm going to move on to actions that pertain to supporting adoption of electric vehicles in the community. Okay, and we'll give it a little bit more. Um, it sounds like telematics is something people don't know a lot about. <laughs> so let's give it just a few more seconds. But people are interested, so looks like most people are not familiar, but interested to learn more. Okay, 10 more seconds. Okay, so no one is telling us they're currently using telematics or have used it in the past, and they're very interested to learn more. So I'll close the poll and let you move forward. Great. Uh, so if you forward to the next slide. So the uh, first action that pertains to EVs in the community is called Make Your Town EV Friendly. This action asks municipalities to support electric vehicle adoption by amending the zoning ordinance to clarify which zones have EV charging as an allowed accessory use. And of course, we're hoping that that will be all zones in the municipality. Also, there's a plug-in electric vehicle ordinance which clarifies design standards and requirements for EV parking spaces in the municipality. Uh, linked in the action of this text is a guidance document for creating those EV-friendly ordinances. And we'll also be addressing this topic in more detail on that June webinar that I mentioned before. The action also requires first responder training, which is important because though EVs are considered safe, they are different from traditional vehicles and first responders need to know how to manage emergencies involving EVs. In the resource, resources section of the action, there's a link to first responder training options and some of those options are cost-free. So uh, nice resources there. And um, 
Then lastly, there are other activities listed in the action to support EV adoption in the community. And um, some of those activities include hosting an EV awareness event, such as a ride and drive event or ribbon cutting for uh, public EV chargers or having an incentive for electric vehicle adoption. Participating in National Drive Electric Week is a great way to support EV adoption. And you can see the link for that event is there, listed there. Um, information about all these activities is included in the action as well. Next slide, please. Uh, the next action is public EV charging infrastructure. This action is worth 15 points and focuses on guidance for EV charging installation and outreach for public EV chargers. The procurement guide has more information about EV charging equipment available and incentives for that. So we recommend uh, looking there for resources as well. And in the text of the action, there's information about getting EV chargers listed on EV charging maps so that drivers can find your charging stations. There's also guidance about installation cost and best practices, and we'll be covering this also in the June webinar. Um, another thing I want to point out on this slide is the picture of the Glen Rock Environmental Commission's um, charging station that they installed. Uh, you can see that the uh, equipment was donated by a local car dealer, and we see a lot of municipalities using this model successfully. So if you're looking to install EV charging equipment for public use, consider um, contacting your local dealers to ask about sponsorship. Next slide, please. So now I just really quickly want to mention an action that technically speaking is not part of the energy section of Sustainable Jersey Certification Program. But if a municipality is taking the time to work on EV infrastructure, it makes sense to look at the effective parking management action as well. This action uh, is worth 10 points and has guidance for using existing parking efficiently, reducing demand for parking and enhancing walkability. We recommend looking at this action while thinking about these transportation issues. Uh, next slide, please. So now um, I'm going to pivot from transportation actions to solar. And Zenon already covered the um, on-site solar for municipal facilities action. So I'm gonna talk about the two actions that are geared at supporting solar in the community. And I'll also talk about the New Jersey Community Solar Pilot. Next slide, please. The first action is the Make Your Town Solar Friendly Action. The purpose of this action is to create solar, supportive solar ordinances and streamline permitting for solar projects. The action requires adopting a solar zoning ordinance, and there's a guidance document embedded in the text of the action to help with that. Uh, also amending the permitting fee, a flat fee structure is recommended to discourage installation, to avoid discouraging <laughs> installation of large scale projects. And the action also requires streamlining the permitting process by posting a checklist online of the permitting requirements. And lastly, municipalities need to complete an additional permit streamlining measure from the list in the action. And you can see that there's um, that list there. Uh, the next slide, please. The next action I'm gonna talk about is the community-led solar initiatives action. Uh, the purpose for this action is to support installation of solar projects in the community. Municipalities that have supported Projects included in the New Jersey's Clean Energy Program Community Solar Energy Pilot Year One can get five points in this action as well. Another path for creating, uh, for supporting development of solar projects in the community is to create a solar purchasing program. Two common solar purchasing programs are Solarize campaigns and online solar place market, online solar marketplaces. The action has guidance about setting up both types of these purchasing programs. For additional points, the municipality can complete activities to promote solar and municipal, municipal incentives for solar. There are a list of possible ways to meet these requirements in the action. Next slide, please. Another option for bringing to solar to the community is the New Jersey Clean Energy Program Community Solar Program. As the name implies, it expands access to solar in the community, particularly low and moderate income residents. If you're not familiar with community solar, it's a model of solar where the billing credits for the solar project can be applied to multiple subscribers' electric accounts. For example, if you look at the images at the bottom of the screen, in the past, residents of a multi-unit building wouldn't have been able to install uh, solar on the roof. 
Now a large array can be installed on the roof and building occupants and other community members can subscribe to the project and get the benefits of solar. Another model of community solar shown in the second picture is off-site ground mount array at a place like a municipal landfill. One of the great things about community solar is it's a way to make positive use of difficult sites like landfills. In addition to expanding access to solar, community solar creates savings for subscribers. Local generation of clean energy and some projects may have local workforce components added to them. If the municipality decides to be a subscriber to the project, that also reduces municipal emissions. And there's a sense of community pride at having a local sustainability project. Who can subscribe for community solar projects? Any metered customer in the electrical service territory where the project is cited can subscribe. And that includes renters, businesses, municipalities, homeowners, and other um, customers of the electrical service. Next slide, please. To support community solar, Sustainable Jersey has a new guidebook coming out soon. And uh, key considerations that are detailed in the guidebook include uh, how to design projects to maximize the benefit to low and moderate income residents, helping municipalities choose their role in the project, evaluating possible sites for the projects, and selecting developers and other project partners. On May 20th, we're going to have a webinar that reviews Community Solar Guidebook and features case studies from the uh, pilot year one. We're going to go into a lot more uh, detail about the roles that are available for municipalities and community solar in that webinar, but I just wanted to show you this list of possible roles for municipalities to, to play in the community solar uh, program to give you a sense of how much municipalities can do. And you see that there in the text box. The municipal role can range from being heavily involved, such as being a site host, or having a smaller role, such as an outreach partner and promoting the project on municipal outreach channels such as the municipal website or social media accounts. Next slide, please. Here's a list of projects that were selected for inclusion in the Community Solar Pilot Year One. Your municipality may consider reaching out to these projects if they're located in the same um, electrical territory and seeing about adding outreach support to the project. Next slide, please. So now we're going to move off of solar and move to energy efficiency outreach actions. These actions uh, support municipal outreach campaigns for both residential and, sec residential and commercial sectors of the community. Next slide, please. To make completing these actions easier, Sustainable Jersey has just developed an energy efficiency outreach toolkits for both the residential and commercial. And these um, toolkits include outreach, template outreach materials best practices, and other tools to help municipal outreach campaigns. We're going to have a webinar to introduce these toolkits on May 12th at 1 p.m., and I hope that you'll be able to join us for that. After the webinar, there's going to be three trainings scheduled at different times for municipalities that are interested in getting started on outreach campaigns. And um, we're going to launch a poll really quickly to in this, uh, with the COVID situation, uh, knowing what time of day is best for people to participate in these kind of trainings, we just want to make sure that we're scheduling them at times that work for you. So if you could go ahead and indicate which times would likely be best for you, that would be very helpful for us. And while that poll is running, I'll mention that one of the things that's going to be covered in that webinar and in the trainings is how uh, the COVID-19 situation affects the outreach campaigns and how we can plan around, um, around the current situation. And I think while we're giving that um, poll a little time to run, I'm going to go ahead and say that the first energy efficiency outreach action I'm going to talk about is the residential action. Yeah, we have about, <clears throat> excuse me, about 50% who voted. Votes are still coming in fast and thick. Um, looks like almost any time of day is actually going to work. Um, people are clicking a lot. Please click all the times that uh, work for you. Um, this is so very helpful. We'll give it 10 more seconds.
and we'll give you an opportunity in the survey that comes up right after this webinar. You're welcome to put information in the uh, question box right now uh, to have a consultation, you know, with Sustainable Jersey and Clean Energy Program folks if your town is interested in, in just consulting with us about uh, launching a campaign. Okay, about half the folks have voted. We've got some great information. Thank you so much. Close great. the poll. Okay, so can you move to the uh, next slide for me? And uh, like I said, residential energy efficiency outreach. Uh, this, um, so energy savings upgrades uh, can help homeowners save up to 30% of their energy cost. And also it increases the comfort and safety of their homes. This action focuses on the Home Performance with Energy Star program, which is available through New Jersey's Clean Energy Program. Uh, the Home Performance with Energy Star program offers residents up to $4,000 in rebates and zero or low interest loans to do upgrades on their homes. And you can see in the images on the right that these are some of the um, materials that are gonna be available in the toolkit. These are, um, and we're gonna be talking about this more in depth on the May 12th webinar. You can see at the bottom, that's a template uh, flyer, and you would fill in the information about your um, specific custom local uh, information and be able to use that template flyer. In the middle is a best practices um, sheet for outreach campaigns. And at the top, we also have template social media posts with images and um, some pre-developed text that will be available as part of the toolkit. And uh, now if you'll go to the next slide, I'm gonna give a little bit more on how the residential campaign, outreach campaign works. In order for a resident to participate in the Home Performance with Energy Star program, the first step is to have a home energy assessment. The 20 point level of this action asks municipalities to identify a home energy assessment offer to be the centerpiece of their municipal outreach campaign. The municipality can do this in one of two ways. If the municipality is located in the utility service territory that has a home performance with Energy Star assessment offer, they can partner with the utility to do the outreach campaign. Currently, two utilities have home performance with Energy Star assessment offers, and those are New Jersey Natural Gas Save Green Project and the South Jersey Gas Smart Energy Partners Project. So if your municipality is located in those service territories, territories, you can partner with the utility to do an outreach campaign. The other approach is that municipalities can issue a request for proposal for one of the home performance with Energy Star contractors to um, give a proposal for an assessment offer. There are nearly 100 home performance with Energy Star contractors, and the text of the action has a link to a template request for proposals. Uh, or RFP to make selecting a home energy assessment offer to feature in your municipal outreach campaign easier. There's also a guidance document about issuing RFPs in the text of the action as well. Next slide, please. The next action is the commercial energy efficiency outreach action. This action focuses on promoting the direct install program uh, that Zenon mentioned earlier, and commercial entities can save up to 80% of the cost of energy saving upgrades for small and mid-sized businesses. Equipment eligible for upgrades through the direct install program includes lighting, heating, cooling, and ventilation, which is also called HVAC, um, refrigeration, motors, natural gas systems, and variable frequency drives. And on the right side of the screen, again, you'll see samples from the toolkit. Uh, First, we have the template flyer for the commercial program, and that text in yellow is where you're gonna customize with your local information. And then behind that is the template press release, again, um, has highlighting where you're gonna customize with local information. And we're gonna be going into more detail on the toolkits and how to um, access all those resources in the May 12th webinar. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, next slide, please. We always recommend uh, for both types of outreach campaigns that when municipalities are starting the campaign, they check with their utility to see what uh, incentives are offered by the utility that pair with the clean energy pro program incentives. And sometimes the utility is able to offer other support for outreach campaigns as well. For municipalities that are located in opportunity zones or urban enterprise zones, there are enhanced incentives available to both residential and commercial energy efficiency incentives. So if you're located in one of those zones, you'll want to know about those enhanced incentives. 
And uh, more information about those incentives is located on the uh, Clean Energy Program website. Uh, next slide, please. The last action I'm going to be talking about today is the Renewable Government Energy Aggregation Action. Government energy aggregation is um, allowed by New Jersey law, and Sustainable Jersey Program awards points for aggregations with increased renewable content, which is the R in RGEA. In RGEA, municipalities replace the utility as the default supplier of electricity for residents and sometimes for commercial entities. Using combined purchasing power of all the residents, the municipality is able to solicit bids from third-party suppliers with an increased renewable content. To make sure that the municipality has the expertise and capacity that they need to handle an RGEA program, the first step to an RGEA program is for the municipality to hire a consultant. There's a template RFP in the text of the action to help municipalities get started. So what does RGEA look like from the resident's point of view? RGEA is an opt-out program, which means all eligible residents are enrolled, but they have the option to opt out at any time for free. And at the beginning of the project, before the, um, before the municipality becomes the default supplier, the resident receives an opt-out notice in the mail. And then the billing line maintenance, including storm response and energy delivery are still done by the utility. Next slide, please. To support municipalities in creating RGEA programs, Sustainable Jersey has developed a guidebook, and you can see a screenshot from that guidebook on the right side of the screen. Um, the guidebook contains an overview of the RGEA process. Once the municipality hires a consultant, they'll do most of the answering of questions for both public and municipal leaders. But in the lead up to hiring a consultant, the guidebook has a specially designed frequently asked questions section that is designed to help municipalities and green teams have the answers to questions they may be asked in the process of deciding to um, hire a consultant. And it's worth mentioning that RGEA is a high points action worth up to 50 points, and it can be applied to the gold star standard and energy program as a replacement for any of the community side actions. So uh, that's our GEA, and now I'm going to hand it over to Nancy Quirk, who's going to open the floor to questions and uh, comments. Well, thank you both Tracy and Zenon for extremely, you know, innovative and exciting opportunities for folks to get into the energy game. Um, we really want to pause and and thank our sponsors. Um, I'll spend a minute on this, but want to remind folks if you have questions to please enter them into the questions box. We have some time here for questions. Um, our sponsors are valuable in allowing us to put on uh, these educational programs, the trainings to help us create, support us in creating the guidebooks and toolkits. We cannot do this work without these sponsors and several stepped up to help us with the virtual summit this year. Uh, so, so very much a big thank you. And um, I guess I will pause and see if there are any questions. I'll show our speakers again and their contact information if you wanna get directly in touch. Um, I don't see actually any questions um, that haven't uh, kind of been answered on the side. Um, Let's see. I think one question that did come through, and I'll just reiterate, and Tracy, you just touched on this. So the direct install program, uh, the New Jersey's Clean Energy Program uh, incentive program for called direct install, which provides um, a walkthrough energy audit and incentives for mainly HVAC and lighting uh, for commercial entities, schools, nonprofits um, and municipalities. For the local government sector, the program does cover up to 80% for municipalities and school districts. And then if I can back up to those uh, commercial entities that are in the um, opportunity zones and urban enterprise zones, it also covers up to 80%. For those businesses that are not in these areas, it can cover up to 70%, but it automatically covers up to 80% for schools 
and municipalities. I just want to clarify that. Thank, thank you, Nancy, for clarifying that. I, I sorry, I, I misspoke earlier, but um, yeah, I also wanted to mention that uh, the incentives uh, for Smart Start um, uh, for municipalities and K through 12 schools are doubled, and there's also enhanced incentive incentives for pay for performance for schools and municipalities. So um, I didn't want to get into the weeds there, but um, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. Better incentives for municipalities and schools. Great, thank you so much. And I hope you caught that um, URL. If not, just pop us a note. Um, we did also have a question. People were very excited about net zero buildings. Um, I can't say we have a specific answer, but the person wanted to know how many net zero buildings are actually in New Jersey. Um, and another participant sent us a response on the side that there actually are dozens um, and we'll try and get uh, further information out on this into our um, actions and on our website. It looks like there's very high interest in that. So um, it's been around for uh, quite a while here in New Jersey. So thank you for that question. Yeah, I would also add, uh, I was going to mention this earlier, but uh, there is one that you can look up that was one of the first, which was um, 31 Tannery project and, and it's located in Branchford, New Jersey. And, uh, but yeah, now it's actually become fairly common. Um, so you probably could find a lot more and we can, we'll look, we'll look up some more to share later. Okay, anything else you wanted to say, either of you? Uh, we do have a couple of minutes. We don't have questions coming in. Um, so we, and it was a long webinar, so I appreciate everyone hanging in. Everyone did hang in, so that's great news. Everyone gave us some good information in the poll questions. Um, you know, one thing that I would add is if you're at all interested in looking at the um, electric school buses, that report that I mentioned from the U.S. Public Interest Research Group about um, costs and lifetime um, maintenance and fuel usage costs for electric school buses is fascinating. And I'm going to, as soon as I find that link, post that in the, um, in the chat for everyone to see. Thank you. Okay. Well, we appreciate you attending. Um, please join us for our other virtual sustainability summit events. There's something every day of the week at when we've offered them at different times of day to kind of accommodate. Many of them are quite uh, informal, just a chat, a Zoom chat, uh, sharing networking with other green team members. Uh, we have a variety of you know, platforms that we're using during this time to to continue to engage. We've been very, very happy with the, you know, the amount of people who are signing up for each of our webinars and our events. So thank you again for uh, participating. And um, we will be posting the recording and the PowerPoint slides on our website. You'll get an email from the same address that you registered for this webinar. We'll be sending you an email with a link to the exact place on our website where you can look at the recording and and the PowerPoint slides. Uh, they'll be up probably give us a day or two. It takes a little while. Um, but but yeah, several folks are interested in that. Is there anything else? I'm not quite sure. Um, okay, so Tracy in the chat box, Tracy put the link to that uh, EV school bus report that she mentioned. So if you want to grab that before we close out the webinar. Last call for questions. I'll give it another minute or so. Um, again, kind of shed some glory on our, our, our loyal sponsors. Um, so thank you once again for that. And contact information, if you want to reach out to either of the speakers directly, um, or you can reach out to any of us here at Sustainable Jersey and we'll get your inquiry to the right person. Okay, with that, I think we'll close out. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Zenon and Tracy, for fabulous work. Thanks to everyone. Bye-bye.